All right, follow me. We're going to go inside, teach you about malting. Once the farmer drops off the grain and we put it in the silo or we have it stored in super sacks, we bring it in on this chain vase system. So if you follow me over here and you look straight up, there's these two metal pipes. One of the pipes is bringing grain in and it's returning empty. Inside that pipe is a chain with plastic pucks and it's just carrying the grain from the silos to the steep tanks, which we're about to head to right now. So no boots necessary to go up to the steep tanks, but if we're, if we're out on the floor, we always put on our specialty boots here. We are a food grade facility and we are an organic certified facility. So we have uh, certain procedures we have to follow. We'll go over some of the cleaning. Um, we actually have a machine we call the Zamboni that cleans these floors. It looks like a Zamboni, but it's a ozone generator that scrubs the floor and then sucks up. And the ozone that's left on the floor evaporates out, leaving a uh, food grade clean surface. So the chain vey that's carrying the grain to the top of the steep tanks is dropping it in. On one tank, we have a uh, grain that's already been submerged in water that we're going to spread uh, shortly. And the other one we are currently steeping in. This tank we're gonna spread onto floor three. And this tank is getting steeped in today. Uh, remember I mentioned that the grain arrived in between five and 10% moisture by weight. Our job is to get it up to 45% moisture by weight. Once it's at 45% moisture by weight, it'll start to sprout. The first sign of sprouting is a tiny little white nub that comes out of the kernel. It's called chitting. If you've ever heard of chit malt, it is uh, a low to almost, almost no modified barley that we will uh, put in the kiln. So it is something that we use in a small percentage to build body, foam, head retention, put a little haze in your IPAs. Uh, but generally speaking, we're gonna do two days in the steep tanks and five days on the floor. And that'll allow uh, modification to happen. It'll allow moisture to travel through the kernel so those enzymes can do their job when it gets to the mash tun at our uh, customers' brewery. So what we do with the bubbling is that that is really just keeping it from building a pile. We don't want it to build like a mound. Got to put on our boots before we walk out there. This is our Butta 12 barley. Uh, as you can see, the floor looks wet. It's not moisture from the grain, it's actually condensation from that chilled uh, glycol line that's running through the floor. Uh, the germinating barley wants to create its own heat. Left to its own, uh, it would well exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit on top. We try to keep the top of the grain bed at 65 and the bottom touching uh, around 55. And twice a day, we'll actually turn this barley using uh, this machine I've, I've named Tina. Uh, you can see that I've, I've also marked it with uh, a sticker of my own. More information on that later. We have to turn the malt twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Uh, the reason being is as it's out on the floor, the rootlets that are forming are gonna wanna tangle together. Once it becomes a uh, kind of a tangled mass, it can't uh, regulate its temperature. It starts to get too hot. It starts to really become hard to work with. So we're trying to have a slow breakdown of protein, of beta-glucans, and make sure that everything is, has even uh, accessibility to temperature, moisture, oxygen. So twice a day, we're gonna use this turner, and inside there's these turning paddles. And we pull this, it's like mowing the lawn, you try to get every inch. Over the course of five days, the uh, grain will germinate on the floor, again, getting turned twice a day. And you can see these rootlets are no joke. So once we're at five days, you'll usually see about 80 to 90% hydration on day five. A hydration test is basically where we take um, 25 to 50 kernels, we submit, uh, submerge it in boiling water for one minute, remove it and then we slice the kernel in half and we check how much of that starch has kind of gelatinized and become more of a kind of a cloudy gelled consistency. If it still has a white starchy pearl in the middle, that is un unmodified. On day five, we wanna see it in the high 80s, low 90s uh, of, 
uh, hydration. And that lets us know that the next day when we load it, it'll be fully modified. So steeping in right now, we have uh, about a 12 barley grown by Sierra Nevada on their estate in Chico. Right now on the germination floor, we have a batch of spelt grown on their estate that we are floor malting. Used in a similar way to wheat, uh, spelt is gonna add uh, a little bit of body. Uh, also, spelt compared to wheat is a little bit more of a nutty flavor, a little bit more pungent in flavor. You'd maybe use this in 10, 20% of your grist. Uh, more than that, it can get pretty sticky. There's no husk. So just like if you're using rye or wheat uh, in a high percentage, you should definitely add some rice hulls to make sure you have filtration in that mash. After five days on the floor, our crew gets out on the floor and we slowly move now green malt into this pit. The pit behind me is a conveyor that leads up to this incline conveyor. And once it goes up the incline conveyor, it'll drop down to what we call our slinger. Uh, our slinger is the machine on the platform in front of the kiln where a red belt is spinning. And by controlling the speed of that belt, uh, you're controlling how far you're shooting the green malt into the kiln. The kiln is the big white box to my right, and it has a false bottom. That, bo that false bottom is perforated, allowing hot air uh, that's generated here to my right to pass underneath the green malt. We try to make sure that the uh, grain is always level inside the kiln because that hot air is gonna wanna take the path of least resistance. So a shallower bed, it'll get more of the hot air passing through. A deeper bed will get less. So if it's all even and we have uh, very powerful fans blowing hot air, underneath the entire bed, it'll come up and out the exhaust evenly, cooking the entire uh, batch uh, in a uniform way. Every batch is either eight tons done on floor one and floor two here. Each, each floor is eight tons. Or floor three uh, is a 10 ton batch. So inside the kiln, we're either about 24 inches deep in grain if it's an eight ton batch or about 29 inches deep in grain if it's a 10 ton batch. I do a little bit of brewing when I can on my own and we've got this system that has been here for a few years. It, it actually needed a little bit of work and I put in some work on replacing the burner. Uh, also the pump that's attached in the back is no longer work so I've got my own pump I'm using but this will do uh, you know a half barrel. We've got our HLT here with an electric coil so Typically, if I'm heating up 20 gallons, uh, I'll put in 10, heat it uh, with the electric coil because 20 is a lot for that element. Uh, I'll put the other 10 in the kettle and pump it up and it'll give me a chance to also uh, sanitize my pump in that, during that pumping. Um, so from here, we've got our, our mash tun with the basket. You know, I'm making mostly uh, Saison's Brett funky stuff and the way that we're doing the cooling is we've got the uh, heat exchanger here and I actually uh, plug it in through our CLT so our cold liquor tanks which is what we use for the steep water on the steep tanks that's around 45 degrees and so I'll just uh, without a pump or anything there's enough volume in that tank that the, the hydrostatic pressure will just push it right through and then I just have a line going out to the drain and Leave it, leave it going for 15, 20 minutes and it barely uses any of the water from the tank. As you can see, I've been busy with my, uh, my brewing here on site. These two were actually brewed at uh, the new hen house location, the old Iron Springs Brewing. Uh, at their, so it's their new brew pub. I just, I did a collab with them and I actually just took some work uh, on, on its way to the fermenter. This one is a Saison base. These two are more modern hoppy Saison. So I, Pop these with Equinot, Nectaron, and Nelson. So you can see some of the pictures from the inside of the kiln. After two days in the steep tank, five days on the floor, on the sixth day, the green malt will get loaded in the kiln. And after one day in the kiln, between 22 and 26 hours, we will uh, have the moisture back down into the single digits. So the, the journey of the malt started with raw grain from the farm, in the single digits moisture, bring it up to 45% moisture. Now we're bringing it back down to three, 4% moisture in the kiln. Um, once it's done in the kiln, we actually will take down this uh, kind of false wall we have. And behind that is three openings that go to an auger. We shovel the, uh, those eight to 10 tons uh, manually into those three holes where the auger will carry it to an elevator. 
the elevator takes it to the top of this machine, which is called the Cimbria. So the Cimbria is uh, basically cleaning the malt. It's, it's agitating and breaking off of extra husk material or baked on rootlets, stuff that either doesn't taste good or we don't want to sell to the, um, the brewers and distillers that buy our product. That extra husk and rootlet material comes off to the side and that's what you see here. This does not taste great, so I would not recommend you uh, taste it when you come on a tour, but makes for great feed. So um, we have a farmer who picks up spent grain from Almanac, uh, basically spoiled or leftover bread from Firebrand, and our rootlets and husk uh, byproduct. So now the cleaned malt that has come through the Cimbria machine with uh, different kind of uh, shaking mesh perforated shelves getting cleaned on its way, comes out clean and polished to one more elevator ride up to this hopper. So from this hopper, we'll hang a bag and this bagging scale will weigh out exactly 55 pounds. Drop the bag, we pull the bag over, and we sew it by hand. Every bag is handled uh, by, you know, everybody who works here. So everybody who works here, the, the six or so uh, production employees, are hands-on with every bag of our malt you get. Um, from the steeping, to the germination, to the kiln unload, to the bagging, to stacking the bags as you see here to wrapping pallets it's all done by us we've got with a little bit of help of conveyors and you know glycol chilled floors uh, it is otherwise a, a pretty manual gig on every label you'll see the kiln date and best buy we do a six month best buy uh, a lot of malt out there is a blend of multiple kiln dates ranging over multiple weeks or months and uh, a lot of the times they don't put a best buy date and you're getting stuff that is easily six months plus old when we uh, have a best buy date from the kiln date of six months. So for us, uh, we believe that the fresh malt kiln uh, flavor is really what is going to separate our product from um, other producers. You know, we want to make sure that the nuance of uh, the varieties that we use is really picked up in the beer. Flavor compounds that are kind of precursors that are developed on the floor are expressed in the kiln. Those will slowly start to kind of off gas and degrade. We want to make sure that people really get a, a good idea of what our malt tastes like. And the longer it sits, the less expressive it's going to be. So for us, like fresh kiln flavor is what we like. Every label has a QR code which if you uh, scan that, it will send you to the certificate of analysis. When we first bag something, uh, we haven't sent off the sample to a lab yet. So what we'll do is this QR code will be, send you to a typical uh, certificate of analysis where uh, our product, that recipe typically lands. And then after about a week, we'll receive back data from Hartwick, which is a lab, I believe in Colorado, that will uh, give us all the specs you need to to make sure that you're making the decision, the right decision using our malt when your recipe. I think a big thing that homebrewers could do is learn how to read a uh, certificate of analysis and, and understand friability and you know really dive into your SRM and even doing some sensory. So the way we do sensory on our malt, it, you can Google uh, the ASBC hot steep method. If you put it in Google, put .pdf at the end and this method is basically like making a mini mash and that will um, show you the color, clarity, give you a sense of the aroma, but it doesn't do the full mash so that it's uh, sweet. You don't want all the sugars developed as a, you know, as, during like a real mash to overwhelm the aromatics that you're trying to pick up from the grain. I would say homebrewers, check out the ASBC hot steep method, create what you think your grist is going to be, but on a scaled down 30 to 50 gram uh, all you need is a thermos, coffee filter, some hot water, and you can really dial in your, your grist to get you what you want. We keep uh, samples of every recipe between five and 10. So you can see this is Admiral Pills, 2023 batch 90 of the year. Uh, we've, we've got uh, 10 of our Admiral Pills. This is our number one seller. And our other big selling base malts like Fellbloom, Gallagher's Best, and Maiden Voyage, we'll keep 10 samples. For more of our specialty malts that we produce less often, we'll keep five samples, such as our Pacific Victor, which is our version of Vienna malt. 
We have our Midway. We have uh, Kilnsmith, which is our darkest. We don't do any roasted malts. So our darkest malt, Kilnsmith, will get you in the 100-ish SRM category, but it is not something that'll get you that pitch black stout look. Uh, but then again, you only need maybe 2% roasted barley to get there. What this will give you is lots and lots of intense uh, kind of dark cherry coffee chocolate flavor. Um, I really like Kilnsmith. Uh, we make a variety of what we call um, kiln stewed malts. Basically, there's a, a Maillard reaction, a caramelization happening inside, like caramel malt, Munich malt, um, and we make a range of those products. We also do oats, and you can see these are not you know, rolled or crushed or torrified oats. These are whole malted, whole husk oats. We do rye, so this is the uh, Cape rye, and these are all coming from California. We recently developed a uh, malt for our friends at uh, Dust Bowl in Turlock. Uh, they wanted something that is going to be a dextrin malt. We call this Helicara. <laughs> so we also do um, specialty malts for you know, our friends at Ruins Distilling in American Canyon, for example. Gian is the head distiller there. He really liked our Gallagher's Best English style pale malt, but he wanted something with a little bit more kiln character. So we called this, instead of Gallagher's Best, we called it Gian's Best. And so this is a custom malt for one of our big customers. We also recently developed for them a floor malted corn. So this is Maizen. And we, uh, we've, got, we've only done a few batches of this, but we're very happy so far. A lot of uh, our customers are using this in non-bourbon uh, uses. And you know we're still getting data in on what the mill setting should be. But uh, recently, our friends at Foxtail Fermentation in San Jose used this in their Solidarity Ale, which is a beer brewed with the union at Anchor uh, as they try to raise money to, to buy back the brewery. Once the malt has been bagged and it's ready to go, we wrap it and we have a company uh, in Hayward, California called Prism that picks up the order and does order fulfillment. Um, we also will do milling, so if you follow me, we'll take you to the mill. We also will do uh, super sacks for some of our big customers who can handle them. So this is our old mill. It is uh, not, the, not the prettiest, but definitely gets the job done, and we make sure to do a sieve test uh, pretty frequently and make sure that we're actually hitting the numbers we're, we're aiming for. In addition to Admiral Maltings, we have the Rake, which is our pub here. Every beer you see on tap and all the whiskeys on the shelf are made with our malt. We carry uh, usually 10 to 15 different brewers at a time on the board, sometimes more, and we also have cans and bottles to go. Uh, we've got a roughly around 200 customers, mostly uh, NorCal based, but once in a while we do ship some malt. We recently uh, worked with uh, the folks at Lagunitas on one of their wet hop releases, and uh, our, our customers range from, you know, Old Factory in uh, San Francisco, who is the former head brewer next door at Almanac. Uh, of course, Almanac next door uses some of our malt for their lagers. We've got uh, East Brothers in Richmond, California, um, Break Even in Amador, uh, the guys at Brew Built in uh, Grass Valley are big supporters, Seismic Brewing up in Santa Rosa. We've got Pete Support down in SoCal, Pure Project in San Diego. Um, so many great breweries um, using our malt. We appreciate them and we love to buy back their beer and serve it here. Our pub's open every day but Tuesdays. Uh, that's why we've got the place to ourselves today. But I'd recommend you come in, check out what we've got on draft and of course order some food. We've got a great barbecue program and uh, you can actually watch the malting happening right through these uh, windows in our booths. I can't think of anywhere else where you can have a beer or have some whiskey made with the malt this close to the source. We're located here at Alameda Point, which is the former Navy base. We've got a great lineup of neighbors here in what we call Spirits Alley. We've got Almanac, we've got uh, Faction, we've got uh, Humble Sea recently opened their tap room, we've got St. George Spirits, we've got Hangar One, uh, we've got a few local wineries. Uh, Alameda Point's an up and coming spot and we're happy to be here. We really think that uh, the history of this part of the island is, is uh, makes it a, a pretty cool beer destination. We offer malt for home brewers by the pound, uh, as well as of course our professionals up to super sacks, 2,000 pounds. 
And uh, if you're just a consumer and you want to grab some beers to go, we've got cans and bottles for you. We've been open roughly six years, and this building used to be a dry goods storage during World War II. A lot of these buildings were used in, uh, for different reasons during the war. The USS Hornet is uh, not far from here. Uh, it's worth doing a tour. We converted this place starting about eight years ago. And six years ago, we made our first batch, and that first batch of malt is still sitting in oak down the road at St. George Spirit, so we're looking forward to that whiskey coming out. I've been here for uh, three years, started part-time, got into full-time about six months in, and two years ago, I started helping with the social media. So I was very happy to connect with Dylan over at Hop Killer. Hope you'll check us out at AdmiralMaltings.com and on uh, Instagram, Facebook is just at Admiral Maltings. The Rake is also available online at therake.admiralmaltings.com and on social media at The Rake Pub. Uh, so Instagram, Facebook, come check us out and free tours on Sundays at three o'clock.